Um, so my name is Mark Ledbury and I'm here on behalf both of the Power Institute, which I direct here at the University of Sydney, and uh, the journal Discipline, about which I will say a few more uh, things in, in a few moments. But first, I would like to acknowledge, as I sit here in the Camperdown campus, that the lands of the, um, the campuses of the University of Sydney are built on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded by treaty or sale. And as we continue to educate and think and learn on these campuses, we wish to pay respect to the thousands of years of tradition of cultural knowledge and transmission of knowledge embedded forever in Aboriginal custodianship of country. So I um, am delighted to welcome you uh, to this uh, image complex, the second of our image complex series. Um, and I would, before I um, allow my co-host and uh, the convener of the series, Nick Crogan, to say a little more about our distinguished speaker today, I just want to say that obviously the Power Institute is uh, more used to convening live events, and but but we're very delighted that we've been able to sort of transform our programming to allow international voices and the latest ideas, thoughts, and critical judgments in the visual arts to keep flowing and keep being discussed um, uh, here in Australia and worldwide. And I want to especially acknowledge my uh, co-host Nick and Discipline, the journal that he uh, runs. It's, it's a publisher of contemporary art, a contemporary art journal, which is edited by Helen Hughes by David Homewood and by Nick Crogan, designed by Robert Mill. You probably know it, it's a fantastic journal. It publishes research essays about contemporary Australian art, histories and themes of contemporary art, and uh, as a global industry, as a phenomenon. And its latest issue, published in uh, late 2019, explored the Southern perspectives of Chile and Australia in comparative context. So um, I think I've probably said enough, but I shall now, uh, again, expressing my great, uh, grateful thanks to Lisa and to Nick, I shall now hand over uh, to Nicholas Crogan to introduce our guest speaker and to uh, convene the rest of uh, this seminar. So thank you very much and uh, welcome to Nick. Good morning and evening. Uh, thanks so much, Mark, for that introduction. Um, my name's Nick, I'm the um, Events and Programs Officer at the Power Institute and uh, the co-editor with Helen Hughes and David Homewood of uh, Discipline Journal. Um, like Mark, I'm speaking today uh, from the unceded sovereign lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I'm really um, delighted to welcome our audience um, from uh, many different Indigenous lands across Australia and the US. Um, as Mark mentioned, this event is the second in a new lecture series uh, that explores the interlinked histories of art, power, and visuality in the United States. At the heart of the series is the, is the concept of the image complex. This term was coined by Yates McKee and Meg McLagan to describe the infrastructure that underpins our visual lives. The image complex is not one thing, but rather a network of people, institutions, technologies, and platforms, including the one we're on now, that produce and circulate visual experience. This infrastructure importantly produces not only images, but also the very way we see. To explore this idea, this series brings together four of the most exciting scholars working in and around art history today. Our first lecture uh, in September was with Jolene Rickard, who spoke to us about Indigenous visual sovereignty. Um, and we also include in the series, Jennifer Gonzalez on feminist art and war and Nicole Fleetwood on mass incarceration. Thanks to our online format, uh, these scholars will be speaking to us directly from the United States. Uh, only days away from the election now, uh, we don't need to be reminded that the United States is far from being a stable or uncontested concept. Uh, and this series will explore how the image complex exposes the limits of the US, even as it reaches beyond them. Our goal, however, is not just to understand the ways in which the image complex governs lives in and outside the United States. Uh, instead, our speakers will also tell us about alternative systems of art, visuality and power that exist alongside the image complex, resisting it and sustaining alternative ways of living. Today, I'm really pleased and honoured to be introducing to you Professor Lisa Lowe, 
uh, who is the Samuel Knight Professor of American Studies at Yale University. Uh, for over three decades now, Professor Lowe has been analysing the interlinked histories of race, immigration, capitalism and colonialism um, and continues to be um, an influential figure in, in many different fields, including literature, um, French studies, uh, Asian American studies, um, and of course, art history. So to introduce you a little to Lisa's work, um, we're gonna begin today with a short uh, Q and A, um, where I'm gonna um, pose a few questions to Lisa, um, and then we'll move on to Lisa's talk. Um, and at the end of the talk, um, we'll have some time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, um, I'd encourage you to use the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. There's a little button that says Q&A. Um, and you can uh, write in questions, uh, and you can also see other people's questions and uh, vote them up if, if you would like us to, to get to that. Um, so um, firstly, uh, thank you for joining us, Lisa. It's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose unceded land Sydney stands. Um, and to give my respects to the Kinnipiac, Pequot and Mohegan peoples who are the traditional caretakers of the land on which I work at Yale University and the Wampanoag, Narragansett, Nipmuc and Massachusetts people on whose land I live now in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you also, Nick, and also to Mark Ledbury for this invitation to speak with you. Um, thanks so much, Lisa. I thought we'd begin by talking about where um, the place that you're speaking from. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we know here in Australia that um, in the US at the moment, you're in the midst of um, a, an epidemic that's still peaking. Um, and you're also uh, days away from a national election. Um, yes. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, what is it like there for you now as a writer and as a teacher and as a voter? Well, to be honest, it's a challenging time. There are several mounting perils, um, as you've mentioned. The pandemic, um, there are now nearly 9 million cases and over 200,000 deaths without um, a federal plan for how to address the pandemic. Um, there's the regularity of police murders of black and brown and indigenous peoples. Um, and then there's also the current government signaling in plain sight that it doesn't intend to leave office after next week's election. So, um, so it's a very tense time. But even before COVID, the U.S. was experiencing uh, the political illegitimacy of undemocratic electoral processes. Um, deep social divides, extreme economic inequality um, due to decades of neoliberal divestment in social services, the inaccessibility of healthcare, uh, and the growth of policing and carceral industries. So there's a definite sense of jeopardy right now. Mm. It, it recalls Gramsci's comment about um, the interregnum as a time of monsters where um, the old world is dying and the new world is struggling to be born. We're definitely having some morbid symptoms here. <laughs> morbid indeed. Well, I thought we would um, track back a little bit um, and I wanted to ask you about um, your um, longer career um, as an academic. And um, like our previous speaker, Jolene Ricard, you actually first sort of entered academia in the 1980s. Um, and you completed your PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz uh, in 1986 on a topic that also became your first book, which was on Orientalism. Um, and I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit about the sort of academic environment that you were working in at the time and how you came to focus on Orientalism? Certainly. Um, I had done a BA at Stanford in history, which was very traditional and then decided to take a few years off and write poetry and work in a bookstore uh, where I would stalk and read the new books in theory and philosophy. And this, of course, was the heyday of the US receiving English translations of post-structuralism, Foucault, Derrida, and so forth. 
Um, so I was curious after reading Frederick Jameson's Prison House of Language. So I started taking some courses at a local at the local university, and I stumbled into the History of Consciousness program, um, where I ended up studying with scholars whom I now understand were really pathbreaking, uh, very decisive, important intellectuals, um, and were inaugurating important questions about knowledge production by different disciplines. So I, I worked, for example, with James Clifford, who um, was placing the history of anthropology within European colonialism, and Donna Haraway, uh, who was bringing a feminist critique to the history of science, and Hayden White, um, who was analyzing the tropes and rhetorics of European intellectual history. Um, I wrote my dissertation on Orientalism in Montesquieu, Flaubert, Roland Barthes, and Julia Kristeva um, after noticing the particular place of Oriental otherness in the French intellectual tradition. Um, and a lot of this work, of course, was taking place within um, the sort of relatively new field then of cultural studies. Um, could yes, you say perhaps that, a bit about what that term meant at the time? Well, I remember there was um, a new Center for Cultural Studies just as I was in graduate school in the early 80s and, um, and you know, bringing people from the Birmingham School and uh, Homing Baba and others. And um, I think it, it you know, it was the beginning of this interdisciplinary interrogation of traditional objects and methods. Um, and of course it means something very different or not very different, but something different in the US than it does in England. But, um, but I think in the early moments, it was actually kind of similar in its intent to, to break free of, um, for example, the containment of literary objects as merely aesthetic and seeing them as material social forces and the production of uh, subjects in society, power, economy, and so forth. Mm. And um, this is uh, something that um, we talked about with Jolene in the last lecture, but um, moving into the 1990s, uh, the late 80s and early 90s in the US, um, the sort of political rhetoric around cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism was very dominant. Um, and it was um, at this time that your work um, shifted to the political and legal history of the United States. Um, and in particular, what your really groundbreaking book um, from 1996 called um, Asian American Cultural Politics. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the history of this term, um, Asian American Cultural Politics, um, and in particular, why um, the, the subject, the Asian American subject is so important in US history. Thank you, that, what a great question. Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, it's important to place these discussions in the discussion of critical race theory. And um, I think, you know, the 1980s is a time when, um, again, as part of this, this unsettling of traditional disciplinary knowledge, critiques of uh, race and, and racialization are, are really um, on the rise. So like Australia, the, the Western United States was the destination for Chinese migrants in the late 19th century who worked building the transcontinental railroad and in mining and agriculture. Um, and these migrant workers performed essential labor, but were barred from citizenship because they were racially not white. There's a 1790 statute that um, dictates that only white property owners could be citizens. And um, this continued, of course, and they were racially marked as non-citizens. Um, and they were met with anti-Asian violence and were barred from further immigration uh, until the mid 20th century and really not admitted into citizenship until the mid 20th century. And immigrants from Japan, Korea, the Philippines, South Asia, and, and other Asian locations were treated in very similar ways, first recruited as racialized non-citizen workers, and then barred from citizenship and also barred from further immigration. Until 1965, when there was a Immigration and Nationality Act that created the means for most of the Asian migration that 
exists now is what we would call Asian Americans. Um, so what I discussed as Asian American cultural politics is the way in which cultural production by Asian immigrant subjects in the US, literature, uh, popular culture, film, um, mediates this contradictory history of being at once enlisted as a non-citizen inexpensive labor, but then also excluded from national and political belonging by this bar to citizenship. So I'm, I'm in the, the book, which is now quite old, <laughs> 20 years old, um, I'm trying to situate Asian American cultural production as a site of this contestation. Mm -hmm. And um, that history, of course, um, of um, cultural production um, sort of coincides um, in part with the emergence of the Asian American Kind of liberation movements in yes, the absolutely. 60s and 70s and yes. Asian American studies as a field indeed sort of can be traced and the to call that for moment as well. Studies, really mm. in the 1970s. Um, I um, am keen to get to your talk but I have one last question um, okay. about your most recent book um, called The Intimacies of Four Continents uh, which was published in 2015 um, and in that book you sort of look back further um, to the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you could briefly say a little bit about what the dominant history of that period is that you are writing against um, and what are you proposing um, as an alternative story for that moment? Well, thank you for that question. Um, particularly since I'm not going to be speaking from that project, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit. The research for um, this book, The Intimacies of Four Continents, began actually with my interest in um, trying to understand the global, longer global history of Chinese migration uh, from the 18th century onward. But it quickly became a study of the connections between the movement of Asian labor globally and settler colonialism in the Americas, the transatlantic African slave trade, and then the expansion of Anglo-American, East Indies, and China trades, all under the emergence of category, European liberal categories of freedom. So it's kind of, I, I've often talked about it as an unsettling history of, of liberalism. And I suggest that if we look at each of these histories separately, it disconnects what were related processes um, and, and makes these connections of uh, these interconnections inaccessible. So I read across traditionally separated archives and histories um, and link African slavery and Chinese indentured labor in the Americas with British maritime trade to post opium war, Chinese treaty ports and the Manchester cotton industry that depended on raw cotton on slave plantations in the US South. So I'm linking these disparate uh, archives and, and histories um, and breaking with customary modes for organizing history. So your, your, your question is, what, what is the history we receive? We, we usually receive distinct national histories of uh, national progress, um, the triumph over uh, adversity, the expansion and modernization of industries and so forth. So what I'm, what I'm doing instead is really reading laterally rather than a history of progress and looking both at what the archives reveal and what they conceal. Um, and you know, in, in this regard, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of work now uh, in the US considering this question of how traditional, particularly state archives are organized in relation to the interests of these property owning white citizens I was just mentioning. Um, and that the archives themselves uh, suppress the suppressed indigenous reports of indigenous and enslaved and colonized life. So, so I was reading uh, in Ann Stiller's words, I'm reading these archives uh, along and against the grain, trying to make these connections. Um, so what I found was that these liberal ideas of free labor, free trade, liberal government, uh, actually linked the transatlantic world of plantation slavery to the expansion of colonial trades and coerced migration from the Chinese treaty ports. Um, and this really constituted the conditions for the unprecedented imperial, 
unprecedented imperial dominance of Britain by the end of the 19th century, and then the succession of it by the US in the 20th. Thank you. And um, uh, we'll get onto your talk, but I, I wanted to say before we do that, if um, anybody was in any doubt of the importance of your work for visual arts and art history in particular, I just wanted to hold up your book and the um, image on the front cover, um, an artwork by Yin Kushan Ibari, and you have a really beautiful analysis of this work in the final chapter um, as um, a, another way of condensing and expressing these interlinked histories. Um, so with that, I'll pass it across to you, Lisa. Again, I'll remind the audience that if you'd like to pose a question, um, you can use the Q&A function um, and we'll be coming back at the end um, to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so with that, thanks very much, Lisa, and um, I'll pass the mic yeah. to you. Great. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't want to claim that I actually am somebody who has studied the history of art. It's I'm interested in it, but um, as you can see, I'm I'm really more of a historian and, and somebody who studied literature and culture. Um, so I hope that um, my trespassing will be welcomed. <laughs> um, the title of my talk is Migration, Materiality and Memory. <clears throat> we live in a time of unprecedented migration from countries besieged by war, poverty and military coups. Migrant and refugee lives are interrupted by bombs, checkpoints, and hurried makeshift funerals in a rhythm improvised with each departure and new destination. Contemporary migrants are mostly from the global south, displaced by histories of colonialism, slave trades, and economic globalization. Many are indigenous peoples dispossessed by land theft, military coups, or genocide. They're food refugees, climate refugees, and political asylum seekers. The UN High Commission for Refugees, for example, estimates that a total number of forcibly displaced people worldwide is more than 79 million, the highest level since World War II. The large majority of more than 1 million refugees and migrants to Europe are Syrian, Afghan, and Iraqi, arriving in Europe by land across the Balkans and by sea across the Adriatic, Aegean, and Mediterranean. More than 20 million Asian and Pacific Islander peoples have migrated to the US, many displaced by US militarism from the colonization of the Philippines, World War II, the Korean War, and the US war in Vietnam, to the toxicities of military basing and nuclear testing. After US funded military coup in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, hundreds of thousands of people leave Central America each year to go to Mexico from where they then attempt to cross the border to the United States, twice or thrice migrants leaving one country of origin to relocate in another before moving on. Structural adjustment, development, austerity policies, and securitization are also crucial instruments of border regimes that police migrant movement. The global national security industry, uh, for example, companies like G4S, and many others run military prisons, detention centers, and black sites, or extra legal encampments for states, embassies, and corporations. These private armies wage covert wars and counterinsurgency, often against people who are wishing simply to remain. G4S, for example, is the world's largest private employer in Europe and Africa, and the third largest private employer worldwide. The US border regime has an anti-Black and anti-Indigenous history from the origins of policing in slave patrols and, and efforts to secure Indigenous lands to border detention as a means of capturing and containing people's movements. The discourse of immigrant threat disguises the ongoing settler colonialism of which the imposition and militarization of borders is a part. Migrant life without papers is precarious driven from one's land or prevented from returning to one's land, hiding, fleeing, surviving occupation, enduring deportation, being poor, growing poorer, forced to reproduce, prohibited from reproducing. As the numbers grow, states and non-governmental organizations have attempted to document and map migrant movements, routes, and demography. As powerful as it may be, to convey the conditions of migration through numbers, as I have in this introduction, 
the numbers risk flattening and depoliticizing migration to the degree that a spectacle of statistics can often stand in for a real analysis itself. So in my talk today, I want to share some thoughts about the visual representation of migration and think about which particular figures, modes, and perspectives are often used. Governmental and non-governmental organizations have mapped migrant movements, routes, and demography. For example, I'm going to try to share my screen right now. For example, Fatal Policies of Fortress Europe is an interactive map that lists and spatializes the death toll of migrants on the way to or endeavoring to remain in Europe. It documents 40,555 deaths in the period of 1993 to 2020. An enormous database, it permits one to search data on the dead, missing, drowned, or suicided migrants. The project evokes the social crisis of migration through dramatizing mortality rates. Now, in contrast, this project, Watch the Med, is an online mapping platform for a transborder activist network. Map, uh, Watch the Med intervenes in current migration struggles in the Mediterranean Sea by recording the deaths or violations of migrant rights at the maritime borders of the U U EU as well as documenting the number of safe migrations. The project has a mobile phone hotline uh, for distress calls that are answered by shift teams who speak Arabic, Farsi, Tigrinya, and other languages, and who offer a range of uh, rescue by civilian fleets rather than state authorities. I'm going to try to show how um, the map works. The site has a live feed of the optical and thermal camera surveillance by sea, air, and landborne radars and vessel tracking technologies and satellites to increase chances that migrants may navigate to avoid capture or surveillance. Because the interactive platform is a virtual crossroads that instructs and aids both migrants and activists, many of its activities are clandestine and authorized by law. And activist scholar Maurice Sturls describes the project as a type of transnational transmedial underground railroad that ultimately attests to the instability of the European border regime. Where fatal policies of Fortress Europe positions the viewing public as an innocent spectator regarding the numbers of migrant deaths, in contrast, Watch the Med engages migrants and non-migrants and dynamically operationalizes mutual aid as well as forging new intimacies, cross-border kinships, and provisional communities. Closer to the, the United States, this project, The Wall, is a, one of, that shows the border between the US and Mexico. It began with aerial footage uh, gathered by the USA Today News Network and combined it with federal maps and satellite imagery from the Department of Homeland Security. It creates an aerial a map. Miles. We've uh, been following the real ground. Twisted natural. Um, it creates an aerial map of every visible piece of fence along the U.S.-Mexican border. It's part ethnographic tourism, part nationalist propaganda, and the map is built as a pioneering border virtual reality that enables viewers to have an immersive 3D experience on the ground of the border. It, it also publicizes large stretches of the border that are um, not fortified as if to uh, buttress the, just, the current government's argument for a border wall. Okay. In contrast, this GIS project by the Center for Investigative Reporting is crowdsourced. And it uh, uses current information about the border fence in order to inform migrants and travelers about which parts of the border has walling, um, what type of walling it has, uh, what the likelihood of being detained might be. Humane borders, fronteras compasivas, like fatal policies of Fortress Europe, 
maps the deaths of people attempting to cross the US-Mexican border based on recovered human remains. And it has a GIS open feature through which viewers may search for missing, missing persons. Torn Apart Separados visualizes and curates publicly available data concerning immigration and customs enforcement and customs and border protection facilities. It maps in particular private ju juvenile detention centers and ICE facilities, exposing an expanding carceral landscape of migrant prisons and juvenile detention centers. Migrants in the United States make up the largest portion of federal prisoners incarcerated in a vast network of more than 200 facilities. In their mission statement, the collective that puts together Torn Apart Separados, they reflect, however, quote, data is imprecise, impure, and as much as a, a tool for incarceration and control as it might be for revealing the truth. Maps which, maps, which have become of primary importance to our daily life, are themselves highly contingent fabrications, bending the physical reality of the world to our innate need to grasp and process, and dangerously full of altered data." Unquote. In other words, diverse mapping projects utilize media technologies that are far from neutral. Virtual visualization and aerial surveillance have been critical to the statecraft of foreign policy and war, particularly in the post-Vietnam period. Even before, as Nick Mirzoff has observed, a longer colonial history has weaponized the visual field to detect, produce, and administer colonized subjects and territories. Maps perform the omniscience and scientificity of a statist gaze as they seek to represent peoples and conditions that are entirely uncertain and constantly in motion. Let me show one more site here. Alternatively, Border Cantos is a multimedia collaboration between photographer Richard Misrak and sound artist Guillermo Galindo, dedicated quote, to all those who cross borders, unquote. These graphs photographs of found objects such as shoes, cans, water bottles, or scarecrow-like effigies left in the canyons uh, by both migrants and border patrol evoke everyday life in the presence of the war. The Lindo makes instruments derived from the materials and the structures that are captured in Mizrak's photos and invents musical scores out of these found objects. So for example, the tortilla fono is made of dis the discarded metal cap of an electrical box from the Secure Border Initiative surveillance program, turned into a mallet and string instrument. Flauta de Paniagua is a wind instrument made up of five plastic bottles whose independent pitches are determined by different levels of water in each bottle. And teclata is a keyboard made from canned plastic bottles and caps and cups, excuse me. The surface at the bottom is decorated with border patrol ammunition boxes. As music and sound scholar Josh Kuhn notes, the Lindo makes it possible, quote, to hear the borderlands as a sonorous ecogeography, as canyons, gulches, and ranges that echo and hum, sing and vibrate, but also a sonorous, sonorous political geography that is forever changed by human composers, unquote. Border Cantos portrays migrant life at the US-Mexican border, not as a singular crisis or condition, but as a transformative social space of simultaneous dwelling, passage, life, death, and commemoration. I've taken a moment to show these projects to sample how public discourses tend to represent migrants and migration. In identifying some common ways that migrants are represented, we can see that many representations tend to confirm a normative geography 
Oh, great. I, I see that Nick has uh, offered to all of you the links that I just described. Thank you, Nick. Um, I've taken a moment to show these projects in order to um, identify some of the common ways that migrants are represented. And we can see that many of the representations tend to confirm a normative geography of bounded nation states, which govern migrants in terms of modern narratives of liberal political sovereignty, history, and society. Whether as foreign threat or victim in need of rescue, both national security and humanitarian discourses place the migrant within this implied linear temporality, exemplified by the reproduction of the south to north itinerary as the presumed route of their migration. Yet only a small fraction of people migrating actually go to Europe or the United States. The countries hosting the greatest numbers of refugees are actually in the global south. Many go to Turkey, Lebanon, Iran, and Jordan. Pakistan receives West and South Asians. Chad, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda are the destination of many sub-Saharan African migrants. Germany is the only European destination among the 10 countries who are hosting the largest numbers of refugees. When migrants are conceptualized in terms of the traditional understanding of sovereignty as the nation state's jurisdiction over territory and population, this reiterates the liberal promise of nation state sovereignty as the only desired path to human freedom overcoming unfreedom. And it disavows the histories in which it is the imposition of the nation state that has been the means to dispossess, enclose, colonize, and extract. Figuring the migrant in the language of crisis further depoliticizes and dehistoricizes migrant struggles by obfuscating the historical contradictions of which the forced movement and its criminalization is the expression. Capitalism has always thrived on racialized, insecure, non-citizen labor and reproduces itself through crises. So-called crises are often used to justify aggressive privatization, brutal austerity measures, evisceration of social welfare, and the demonization of the so-called dependent poor. Crises appear to warrant the refortification of states' monopolies on force and violence, whether as the buildup of police, border patrol, drug wars, or prisons, or as nuclear proliferation basing and pursuit of military supremacy. The affective uses of crisis focus attention on migration as if it were purely contemporary, rather than inaugurating what we might call a history of the present that would link migration with the much longer duration of settler colonialism and slavery of which they are, of which these border regimes are a part. The U.S. border regime is an outgrowth of settler colonialism, anti-Blackness, and empire. Harsha Walia reminds us that the Texas border has its origins in preventing slaves from escaping to Mexico, while Kelly Lytle Hernandez traces the growth of Southern California prisons to settler policing of indigenous people and the seizure of their lands. Currently, the U.S.-Mexico border is violating the native Tohono O'odham peoples on whose land the border intrudes. The discourse of immigrant threat disguises the ongoing settler colonialism of which the imposition of borders is a part. In this sense, the migration crisis heralds the unfinished work of decolonization and the failures of racial capitalism and imperialism, and even more, the inadequacy of liberal political representation, free market, or authoritarian states to manage and resolve these failures. For this, for this reason, the figure of the migrant today refers not only to mass displacements, it also reveals the hollowness of claims to resolve this displacement through more liberal democracy, stronger state sovereignty, or the expansion of capitalism. Perhaps the migration crisis is a sign of the public difficulty in reading the object of the present itself, in making migration a domestic issue of national security rather than a sign of the failures of global capitalism, nationalism, and imperialism. It underscores the gap between the inadequacy of our political discourses and material conditions themselves. I want to emphasize that the figure of the migrant should be distinguished from the immigrant. For where the migrant is conceived as perpetually eluding the state, the immigrant is imagined as within the temporality of the state, as subject to being domesticated by the promise, promises of national assimilation and citizenship. 
Immigrants are forced to comply with the narratives of rehabilitation, cure, conversion, and national belonging. Whereas the migrant is stateless, homeless, and rightless, the target of police, armies, and biomedicine, subjected to the extraction of surplus value, surveillance, and carceral enclosure. So the migrant is simultaneously more vulnerable and more transgressive than the immigrant. In the discourse of the increasingly authoritarian United States, the migrant is the state's reification of its national limit and not to be confused with migrating peoples themselves whose lives and survivals are always in excess of the representation of their disposability. In this sense, any typology of the migrant is in tension with the shifting immeasurability of migrant lives and migrant worlds. The migrant as a figure is rapidly conflated with many others, equally constructed as threats to national security. The terrorists, the queer, the diseased, the infidel, the oriental, the disabled. These figures mark the threshold of the nation and herald its contradictions and activate the cultural negativity that refuses integration into the dominant social order. The state's investments in figuring its boundaries is a source for the endless production of new difference, of insides and outsides, of good and bad Muslims, of the normative and the deviant from which, quote, society must be defended, unquote. Migrant life attracts yet exceeds capture by either the national security or humanitarian gazes. National security discourse targets and produces the migrant as the limit of national sovereignty even as it continues to translate the migrant into the immigrant through the imposition of visibility, legality, and temporality in the liberal political sphere and to prey upon what remains of migrant lives and labor in the economic sphere. While humanitarian discourses, both state and non-state, tend to cast migrants as victims in need of rescue and protection, but only insofar as they conform to criteria of need and abjection that can be redeemed within liberal regimes of promised freedom. Humanitarian views of migrants are often used to justify militarized governance, <clears throat> what Nada Tanasaski calls humanitarian violence, or forms of care that restate international divisions of political power and <clears throat> justify interventions in terms of suffering victims in need. In this way, national security and humanitarian discourses converge around a construction of the migrant as voiceless and vulnerable, which totalizes state sovereignty while evacuating migrant subjectivity and political possibility, obscuring other forms and temporalities of being. Our modern po liberal political philosophy is founded on the dialectic of unfreedom and freedom, and our political imagination is organized by its teleology and its dialectical temporality. In the United States, political real realism dictates that we act within this statist paradigm of rights, even as we acknowledge its severe limitations. Yet rather than see migrants exclusively through existing political frames of representation, we might appreciate how the migrant who is not merely external to the nation state or a repudiated not same, but what defies and deranges such binaries, that the migrant always refers us beyond an understanding of sovereignty as liberal personhood or the nation state as sole, as the sole political actor. Migrant lives and associations whose itineraries elude the binaries of same, not same, freedom and unfreedom, autonomous will and dependence, value and waste, demand another imaginary to reckon with conditions past and present, offering alternative modalities to be overcome, offering alternative modalities for framing the political, not as a state of unfreedom and unbelonging to be overcome by political emancipation, inclusion, or a successful scaling of the wall but as a political project of becoming and being with, rather than having, owning, or regulating. In destabilizing status definitions of sovereignty, the migrant may also reveal how normative sovereignty is employed to delegitimize other concepts of sovereignty and political justice and community that, is, that are simultaneously being practiced by other peoples. Indeed, envisioning political community in terms other than the statist paradigm of rights is happening all around us. The sovereignty of Native American water protectors at Standing Rock, 
political sovereignty envisioned by the movement for black lives or against Islamophobia, or forms of political relation and community being elaborated by movements for sanctuary, which understand migrants as vital participants, even if they occupy a liminal, transitional, or fugitive social space of uneven, improvised collaboration or interdependency. Envisioning mig migrant sociality then requires a conceptual work that refuses the subjection of migrants and other vulnerable people to the nation state, but also provides an alternative vision of political community in which being and belonging is defined differently. This conceptual work includes understanding histories of non-sovereign, even bonded or shackled life, not as statically unfree, but as replete with expression, survival, and transaction. The exclusive binary of either captive unfreedom or redemptive freedom entraps us in moralizing aspirational forms of sovereignty as the measure of the ethico political, and it recenters the nation state and liberal individualism as the normative life forms, foreclosing other collective formations and intimacies of care, refuge, and interdependence as conditions for survival and struggle. Imagining migrant life beyond the linear transition from unfreedom to freedom or the relation of subject and property might also enable a rethinking of the social and the political anew. To further elaborate, I'm gonna um, start a PowerPoint here. So. To further elaborate the political imagination of the migrant of migrant life as transient refuge memory and reimagination i want to close my discussion with the consideration of the art installations of mohammed hafez a uh, syrian um, architect turned artist following his independence from french colonial rule in 1949 syria has been subject to armed conflicts military coups authoritarian rule, proxy war, and foreign interventions. Since 2011, the civil war has escalated into a violent multi-sided conflict of staggering proportions involving Russia, the United States, and the Turkish military, killing hundreds of thousands of people and giving rise to a massive refugee exodus. Over half the Syrian population, an estimated 10 million people, have been displaced by the ongoing violence, now refugees in more than 100 countries. Mohammed Hafez, a Syrian emigre architect, constructs mixed media installations of bombed, empty, and half-destroyed buildings made of plaster paint and found objects, which depict, depict both the fragility of human life as well as refugee acts of memory. The miniature scenes, some mounted in suitcases and others on wooden mirror frames, feature architectural fragments or remnants of calligraphy worn furniture covered in debris, staircases leading nowhere, ashen clothing hanging on laundry lines, or abandoned cars. The installations portray ruins as the material remains of everyday life in an ongoing civil war, recollected and remembered from the diaspora. The scenes of buildings with blown off facades bring attention to the impact of war on homes and households, airstrikes and bombs killing dozens of people each day while forcing others to flee. This piece called Baggage Number no. Two is one of a series of pieces that are set in battered suitcases, depicting refugee memory of the home space blasted open. War and displacement render familiar domestic objects like a faded Rococo chair, a telephone, carpet, or a leaning plant against a scarred wall. It renders them uncanny and disturbing. Inside and outside have become the same, indistinguishable. The violated empty room framed by a suitcase captures the melancholy of refugee memory. It portrays the suspended recollections carried by land and sea. Susan Stewart once observed that the scale of the miniature comments upon interior and exterior, self and world. The souvenir, often a fragment or in miniature, expresses longing as it seeks both to collapse and transform distance from the point of departure. The miniature contracts the world and expands the interiority of memory. The suitcase itself becomes the replacement for a home that is irretrievably lost. 
Hafez's baggage series comments upon the ways in which migrant histories of displacement and dispossession can't be expressed in the traditional genre for memorializing war. In this way, he fashions miniaturized ruins rather than overscaled monuments, and the scenes are emptied of human figures, not populated. In this piece, Baggage 3, a wall is portrayed as if tanks or bombs have reduced an entire village to a remaining bulwark. Pipes and wires sprout like burnt branches from a busted concrete etched with calligraphy. The remains of a video surveillance camera hangs limp. It is the lack of human presence in the baggage series underscored by the graffiti shadow of a girl in this piece, which emphasizes the deadly stillness of the ruins. While the ruins reference duration, the before and after of irrevocable destruction, the stillness both arrests and deranges the temporality of history. He built me at once a past that is no longer a present other than what it once was and a future whose arrival cannot be predicted. In this frozen moment, the, in, the viewer stands grieving before ruins of home and homeland, strewn with scraps of a former everyday life. The interpolation of the viewer as one who stands before ruins echoes a well-known poetic trope from Arabic poetry. The motif, motif of the ruin is found in a po poetic genre of the pre-Islamic period, wukuf al-atlal, which can be translated to mean stopping or standing by ruins. Centuries of poems in this atlal tradition begin with a nostalgic prelude in which the wandering poet stops before a ruin and mourns what he has lost and loved. Since the word wakuf carries the meaning of both standing and stopping, it evokes a sense of stillness that halts or is outside of time. The atlal trope has endured and today it's been taken up by artists and poets responding to war, destruction and forced exile, particularly in Palestine and Iraq. The poet Mahmoud Darwish, for example, famously took up the Atlal tradition to address the destruction of Palestine and the colonizing violence that preceded and followed. His poem, Standing Before the Ruins of Albirwe, for example, describes his return to the village of Albirwe in Galilee, where he was born in 1941 and lived part of his childhood, but which has been occupied and depopulated by Israeli forces, which was occupied and depopulated by Israeli forces in the 1948 war and was later the site of Israeli settlements. The poem reads, like birds, I tread lightly on the earth's skin so as not to wake the dead. Mohammed Hafez's installations of ruins can be understood as a citation of this Atlal tradition of standing before ruins, yet translated into the language of architecture. Like many of Hafez's pieces, the baggage series contains architectural fragments in ruins arches, domes, minarets, columns, and stucco decoration. In this baggage number three piece, there is a large rosette with a repeating pattern of interlaced vines engraved in the wall. Variations of this intricate symmetrical pattern appear on walls, doors, or windows in his Damascene Atan series as well. The rosette pattern appears in centuries of Islamic art and architecture, and we find vari variations of the rosette pattern as well in Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Sasanian, Numayid, Mamluk, and Ottoman designs. In this sense, Hafez's use of the rosette pattern in scenes of ruin doesn't refer to a pure, inalterable Islamic past, but suggests instead a layered history of encounters and exchanges across continents in ancient and early modern times, both Christian and Muslim, European and Arabic. The engraved rosette designs in Hafez's installations may refer us at once to destroyed heritage sites in Damascus or Aleppo, as well as to the longer Levantine history of successive caliphates, sultanates, regimes, and occupations. Indeed, for the subject who stands before ruins, grieving a history of loss that can't be contained, the distinctions between modern and pre-modern, east and west, life and death, beginning and end, tend to blur and dissolve. The Mediterranean past uncovered in the ruins is not a singular source of origin, but a crossroads of different peoples, cultures, and tradition in excess of what can be named or contained. 
In this sense, the ruins of Hafez's works res resonates with the condition that Horkheimer and Adorno described as the dialectic of modernity, the contradiction by which modern promises of progress, industry, and reason accompany and innovate new forms of misery, extraction, and destruction. Their colleague Walter Benjamin appreciated that ruins are allegories of this dialectic of modernity, inaugurating a process, a sensibility, and a reflection on this ambivalence against the symbol that can, affirms a contained totality of truth, beauty, and morality. Benjamin posed allegory, alluding beyond itself and reckoning dialectically and open-endedly with the barbarism of civilization. Quote, allegories are in the realm of thoughts, what ruins are in the realms of things, he famously wrote. Allegories can lead the viewer to an excess to the world making possibilities beyond or outside the relations of the work or the object itself. Allegory reckons with and defies the violence of the historical and generic conventions that insist on a single universal order of being in the world. Ruins can radically shift our normative embodiment in space and time and our perceptions of parts and wholes near and far, now and then, known and unknown. And so in this way, I'm suggesting that Hafez's ruins convey wall-lessness as an ethical, political, and aesthetic project, which alludes to the violent loss and deterritorialization that are conditions of migration. His pieces resonate in certain respects with the work of other artists who employ objects and materials to comment on this violence of modernity. From Joseph Buse's post-Auschwitz social sculpture made of fat wax felt in wood, to Colombian Dora Salcedo sculptures of disfigured chairs or concrete laden wardrobes, referencing the enduring terror that persists beyond the atrocities of state violence and political disappearance, or to Mizrak and Galindo's collaborations that transform discarded remnants of both migrants and border patrol to make music in real time. Well, it's clear that going to, let's see, here we go. Well, it's clear that visual portraits of migration in art practices differ significantly from the forms of representation employed in the discourses of national security and humanitarianism. In making the general distinction between two modes of representation, I'm trying to point to the problem of representation itself and to heuristically differentiate between an instrumental use of, rep use of representation as a practical practical symbol or reference on the one hand and the aesthetic use of uh, representation on the other. In the case of the websites that use demographics to document migration, visualization is referential and it seeks to make evident within the framework of a stable social totality that ensures representability. While artworks or poetry use metaphor in a dynamic way, naming the shifting of meaning within conditions of historical loss or even the impossibility of a stable social totality. The works by Mizrak and Galindo, Hafez, Darwish, or Salcedo mediate a world disrupted by war, migration, and state violence, and don't intend to provide evidence of a specific time and location within an empirical framework. Rather, these works engage viewers' recognition of object and materials in ways that defamiliarize their ord ordinariness. Remnants of human life are subject to ob obliteration. Everyday objects become uncanny and charged with meanings beyond themselves. These representations suspend the linear progress of history and not only attest to the impossibility of signifying the past or present as stable reference, but affirm the necessity of creating new worlds and political imaginaries that supplement important maps and data. These works ask, what might it mean to a reimagined community beginning from the experience of displacement, statelessness, and ruin? What if our political imagination does not begin with the division of insides and outsides, but rather places radical loss and wall-lessness at its core? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa, for a wonderful talk. And I know that um, the uh, regulation of migration um, in Australia is not something that you have researched, but um, the ideas you pre present today really echo uh, very loudly here. Um, we now have um, plenty of time for questions. 
Um, oh, I'm so glad because I was afraid I, if I was taking too long. I'm glad that I left. No, we, we do. We have plenty of time. And um, to kick us off, uh, we have two um, invited questions from um, scholars whose work um, is um, very much uh, parallel to your own. Um, the first is from um, Pevand Feruja. Uh, who's a lecturer at Islamic art um, in the Department of Art History at University of Sydney, which is where the Power Institute is based. Um, and Pevan specialises in uh, medieval and early modern um, art and material culture from the Islamic world. Um, and she's uh, recently arrived in Sydney um, following numerous uh, prestigious research and curatorial positions in um, Florence, Berlin and London. So um, thanks very much for joining us, Pevan. Thank Hello. you very much, uh, Nick. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that uh, wonderful talk and a really touching uh, presentation. So my question is um, in part inspired by what you were saying before uh, the official talk started about the traditional colonial archive and its relation to the current um, regulation of uh, migration, um, especially in the United States, uh, maybe. Um, so. Um, you were talking about, and um, I know you've worked on uh, the classifications of um, the traditional uh, colonial archive in that um, in the way it's structured and classified, it represents the um, interest of the colonizer. So there is that inherent inaccessibility of the uh, um, uh, traditional archive to the colonized, um, to um, the indigenous people. Um, and then when you were talking about, um, let's say, the figure of uh, the migrant, um, there was this tension between um, perhaps the migrant um, who lacks papers, documents, and the way th there is that connection with the traditional document, with the traditional archive, and yeah. the migrant who um, has objects um, in um, a luggage, uh, objects that are um, really sites of memory and their belonging to a different place as opposed to their own belonging, their lack of documentation, their lack of paper to their new destination. So I just wanted to ask you, how do you um, in your work um, see the first, see the classifications of the um, traditional archive governing um, material and visual archives um, and material histories, um, even those that are emerging, like those that are connected with the question of migration. And how do you see the, the potency of um, these material objects um, and these emerging uh, visual archives really challenging the notion of um, the traditional um, um, archive that is more textual in nature, let's say? That's a really wonderful question. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do really think that, I mean, thank you so much for the, the um, pulling out the critique of the state archive and the types of um, subjects, communities, and ruling powers that it favors and documents and the way in which the state archive tends to um, not just erase and omit subaltern and marginalized groups, people without papers, but also forcibly uh, removes them and, and, and contributes to their non-existence or the, the lack, contributes to the lack of consideration as human subjects. Um, but I think in a different way, material culture and material objects, including visual works or visualizing um, memory, history, and past experience um, can, has, the po the, has the possibility or the potential of eliding that strictly uh, state documentation. <laughs> In other words, it's not necessarily some, the work of Mohammed Hafez, for example, you don't need to know a particular language to be moved by it or to see it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think similarly, objects uh, contain within them different kinds of um, 
meanings, trajectories, itineraries that can be read in much different ways than these official documents can be read. So I definitely think that visual culture and material culture are rich sites for thinking uh, beyond state archives and, and, and the power that state archives are intended to buttress and uphold. Thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Pevan. Uh, we have another um, invited question now from um, Ian Ang. Uh, Ian is a pr distinguished professor of cultural studies at Western Sydney University, uh, where she was also the founding director of the Institute for Culture and Society. Um, and her latest uh, co-authored book uh, is called Chinatown Unbound, Trans-Asian Urbanism in the Age of China. Um, thanks so much, Ian, for joining us. Hello, Ian. Hi, Lisa. Great to see you it's been again. Many years. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. How are you oh, doing? Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was it was great to hear you kind of reflect on on these issues, which are so important right now, especially in this COVID uh, time, where, of course, as you know, uh, you know the, this 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 uh, boundedness and 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 of the nation state is being reasserted uh, in such a kind of a powerful way that, that that the whole notion of 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 boundaries that 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 are kind of uh, porous that 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 we need to kind of negotiate in a, in a much more hybrid hybridized way as you are you have your work has has always engaged with those issues is now increasingly kind of uh, precarious to, 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 to indeed kind of insert the, the, the perspective of the migrant, the liminal perspective of the migrant that you've discussed um, in your talk so powerful. Well, it, it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that if border regimes are meant to capture and contain and cease the movement in or out of Indeed. people, Absolutely. that the quarantine and the pandemic, in effect, has produced that and when you know enacted by the state it it, it compounds it compounds yes. the, the severing of relation and the isolation yes absolutely so uh i uh i have a question for you in relation uh to kind of really i think it's important that what you've uh really presented is is to 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 really think through uh what it means to to read the present uh, this, this very uh, uh, kind of difficult present that we are in, and uh, you talked in the beginning. Uh, I think it was before your your uh, uh, formal presentation, but uh, in the Q and A um, about uh, the uh, morbid symptoms that we are uh, now kind of seeing, not just in the United States, but uh, uh, globally. I would say. Uh, that really points to an interregnum, a, a crisis where the, the old is really kind of uh, dying, but the new can't be born, um, mm. to, to use Gramsci's uh, 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 formulation, of course. Now, I was wondering, in that sense, um, when we talk about that interregnum and that the, in a way the kind of the boundedness and the, the liberal promise of, of the nation state being reasserted right now, but on the other hand, geopolitically, we see kind of like, uh, for example, the rise of China, which uh, problematically really uh, produces a, a, a narrative that, that actually uh, and reinforces uh, the, the, the need for the liberal order to be uh, saved, protected, strengthened, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, what implications does that have? And maybe you can uh, describe that in relation to what's happening in the US right now, um, in re uh, kind of like the Chinese American, uh, or the broad, more broadly, the Asian American perspective in, in relation to Black Lives Matter, for example, and the whole notion of the intimacy of the different uh, racialized categories. Um, how this then gets affected by uh, this uh, shifting geopolitical order, because I find that uh, this is now a moment, uh, especially from the point of view of the Chinese migrant, or, and often 
described as immigrant, of course, not as, not as migrants, uh, it complicates the narrative enormously in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, anti-racist struggle, uh, um, anti kind of nation state struggle also. Yeah. That's Sorry, I mean, it's a bit of a jumbled question, but uh, no, no, no. But I think I, I think I'm hearing what you're, you're getting at. Um, firstly, I mean, when I say liberal state, uh, in describing the U.S., I mean that in terms of a liberalism that was really, um, that founded the possibility of colonialism and empire and actual liberal democracy of um, you know, popular will and popular sovereignty is something that is very remote right now in the United States. Mm. Um, I mean, even the electoral college system or the Senate, which you know, every of the, one of the 50 states has two senators. It's a very mm. undemocratic very unrepresentative system. So, so the degree to which it is liberal in a kind of liberal pol political philosophical sense is, I think that's debatable. Um, <clears throat> I think it's closer to, you know, the, se the seeds of fascism are in liberalism. And I think the morbid symptoms are much closer to fascism than liberalism. So in that sense, I, I, the reason I want to say that is that it's not precisely a, a, a contrast between, uh, you know, socialist China and liberal U.S. I think, you know, they're both uh, different kinds of uh, political systems that are engaged in global capitalism in, in different ways out of different histories. And political sovereignty of both states involves um, imperial moves, whether through uh, global capitalism or political means. Um, so, so I would just say that. Uh, that's the first part of your question. In terms of the, the racial politics within the US, I definitely, I definitely can understand and, and identify what you're referring to. If what you mean by that is that, um, African Americans and, and Black immigrants to the US are racialized very differently than Asians or other kinds of immigrants. Um, and, you know, there's a long history in the US of uh, Asian Americans in particular being um, constructed as a kind of model minority, assimilable. The part of my talk where I'm distinguishing between a precarious migrant who's always a threat to the nation state and the immigrant who's always narrated as assimilable is of course a reference to the model minority and the position in which Asians have been put. Yeah. That, doesn't, that doesn't mean that Asians actually do assimilate in that way. There's plenty of anti-Asian sentiment <laughs> in the United States yeah. um, and bars to you know, economic inequality um, and uh, you know, there's a range of class positions of, of the many, many different Asian immigrants that are in the United States, and also a, a, a wide diversity of um, national origins and so forth. Yeah. Um, so there is a kind of, um, there, there are different forms of anti-Asianism, I think, coming from different um, quarters, um, from the dominant and from different emergent uh, racialized communities. But I, what's been impressive, um, you know, I was talking about the morbid symptoms, but what's been impressive is for months now, there's been, uh, since the May 2019 Minneapolis killing of George Floyd, mass protests continuously across the United States um, that are multiracial. Mm -hmm. And certainly Asian Americans have played a, a role in them. So it really belies this idea of Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in particular as, um, as assimilated into uh, white America and capital. Um, uh, these protests are so interesting. They're, they're, they're asking in very coherent ways um, that the police be defunded or abolished 
and they're really asking um, for the divestment from policing and carceral industries, the buildup of prisons, and the reinvestment in community safety by providing for healthcare, providing for clean food, uh, clean water, food, uh, access to good food, forms of living wage, schools, etc. So um, I think what's interesting about this moment in the US, as much as they're the morbid system, they're morbid symptoms, there is this new world that's trying to be born. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a multiracial world, it's a world that is um, not about identities, <laughs> but about projects and forms of justice and community that really, um, you know, are first and foremost objecting to anti-blackness, but not requiring that you need to be black in order to protest and want to defund and abolish the police. So it's a it's an interesting moment, and I think I, I think that Asian Americans are, um, you know, more often than not on the progressive side of this. Well, that, that's heartening to hear. <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know what it's like in Australia. Well, in Australia, I think one of the biggest issues is kind of uh, in Australia's relationship to China, uh, which of well, course- Well, and you're much more close is, geographically. With uh, the Donald Trump's uh, kind of, of trade war and, and Jeff's uh, new Cold War with China. Uh, and the, uh, what has happened in relation to Chinese Australians in in this context is is the difficulty for Chinese Australians to to articulate a position that does not kind of have to choose between China and Australia, right? I mean, this is one of the biggest issues. Again, uh, referring to the liminality that you, you're talking about, I think it's it's politically important that we we assert uh, the the position of liminality as a progressive politics because now Chinese Australians have to uh, um, uh, uh, provide evidence that they are loyal to Australia in order to even provide kind of a point of view uh, on, mm -hmm. on the issue. So I think that this is a very a difficult and precarious moment for us here. Yes, yes. I wanted to um, jump in um, because there's a, a question here from um, uh, Suzanne um, Banky, who, um, like Ian, is a um, uh, someone who's conducted a lot of research on migration and refugees um, in the Asia Pacific region. She's a um, faculty member at the Department of Sociology and Social Policy. Um, at University of Sydney. Um, so I'll read you um, Susan's question. She says, thank you, Lisa, for this terrific talk, engaging and insightful. My question is about the ways uh, that migrants also use art to engage in diaspora politics, critiquing a home country. There are numerous examples, uh, Rohingya in Bangladesh, ethnic Karen in Thailand, Tibetans creating art and literature globally. Uh, Mohammed Hafez seems to be a hybrid here. Yeah. Um, how might we theorize these material expressions of home differently from those of migrants who use art to express the difficulties of being a migrant? That's a great question. Yeah, and it, it, it reminds me, of course, of um, the still very important work of Stuart Hall on diaspora, um, which I know Ian is shaking her head. <laughs> um, that there are, you know, there are forms of diaspora that, you know, seek, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing his argument, but seek a kind of um, authentic uh, duplication or connection and recovery of a, of a earlier home culture and others, other diasporic culture that really um, acknowledges the break and the rupture that displacement, whether through war or economic hardship or, you know, many reasons um, that there, that there's not a return per se, and that there's a break. And I think in that latter category, um, certainly the, the fleeing a country and uh, representing in art, the trials of persecution, of war, of uh, hardship, um, you know, is, is part of that diasporic visual afterlife. Um, thank you. We, we have another question now um, from another Australian scholar, 
um, Sumin Shim, who's um, currently doing her PhD at ANU, I think, um, in art history. Um, her question is, uh, which I'll read to you. Thank you, Lisa, for this wonderful talk. Uh, my question perhaps speaks more to art systems uh, institutions, uh, but I wanted to ask about the relationship between migrant artists and the reception of their work in the global art sphere. I am, of course, thinking about the controversial Ai Weiwei installation part of the Biennale of Sydney a few years ago, uh, where giant installations of refugees, like your observation on statistics, flattened and depoliticized to a great extent. At what point does migrant trauma slip into spectacle? How mm. can migrant subjectivities negotiate the gaze um, slash co-option from the global north? Or is that gaze irrelevant entirely? That's such a beautiful question. And in a way, it, it contains its own answer, <laughs> which is that there is always this, you know, that, that migrant history and migrant experience is um, in so many ways less represented, less represented by migrants themselves than by other image complexes, <laughs> so to speak. And that mm. it's very hard to protect um, that representation from appropriation or commodification or spectacularization. Um, and um, I suppose, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, how to address the how to, but um, I think discussions like the one I'm trying to have um, center on the power to represent and the necessity of a lack of closure or reduction. Um, and so I'm most attracted to the works that maintain in them this, um, this dynamic that, that give us a little lesson in how to read them and how to read that they, they don't have a closed meaning, that they're, they're part of a long, an ongoing process of reckoning mm -hmm. and, and in, in many cases, commemoration and, and memory. I'm, I'm channeling here that a thread is developing um, from oh. um, Sumin's question. Um, so I will um, channel the other participants. We first had a follow up from um, Gorica Machstorovich, um, um, who said, um, thank you, Lisa, for a wonderful thought provoking talk. Um, I was struck by the notion of um, humanitarian violence um, and was wondering if you can comment more on its connection to the overlapping forms of coloniality and dispossession uh, that you showed through the art installations and maps. Um, and I'll add as well, there was another follow-up um, from Kiara O'Reilly, um, who I know is a member of the faculty here at the University of Sydney um, in art history. Um, and she um, has shared an artwork um, in the Q&As um, that is at the Art Gallery in New South Wales. Um, uh, but she also says, uh, uh, thank you, Lisa, for wonderful and really important research in this ongoing moment of crisis. Another example of problematic art in this space um, was Barca Nostra by Christoph Buchel at the 2019 Venice Biennale. Um, so another example of turning tragedy into an art spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, should art do more than provoke or offer a selfie? Uh, the work of Ben Quilty, who's a, an Australian uh, painter, uh, is exploring some interesting ways of giving voice to refugees through art uh, and recently held a collaborative exhibition called Belonging with Syrian Children at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, so several questions there. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think um, both of these questions are really um, zeroing in on the ways in which um, refugee suffering or the suffering of you know, persecuted peoples are so often um, utilized to uh, reposition the empathy and magnanimousness of um, the privileged population who is, you know, for whom that art is circulating. So, I mean, I do, I do think that there's a, there's a question here, and this is not my expertise, but there's a question here of the art market and it's um it's enclosed quality and and the commodification of art um and you know it's it, it's very clear that migrant art 
is not a um, you know, migrants are not in a strong position with respect to the art world, um, and it's a very overdetermined situation of of appropriation and speaking for. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add um, that. Um, I believe um, Gorica Mastrovich is is joining us from. Uh, she's a professor from um, New Jersey. So thanks, thanks for um, for joining okay. us from the other side of the world. Um, I should say that the humanitarian violence notion is from a scholar named Nada Atanasovsky, who is Romanian American, um, and um, and and works particularly on um, the the ways in which the U.S. humanitarianism in Eastern Europe. Uh, was uh, a cause for US military intervention. Um, I think we probably have time for, for just one more. Um, mm -hmm. And um, this one is um, from Sarah Dem, uh, who is a um, lecturer in the Faculty of Law at University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, and she works on um, public international law and international migration mm -hmm. um, and refugee law. Um, and her question is, um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the ethics and responsibilities of scholars to act in solidarity with migrant struggles in the current moment. Uh, and in particular, the tensions inherent in seeking to intervene and act to make border regimes more, quote, human and livable, uh, and that they may risk reauthorizing the settler colonial state. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this is the, this is a very, a, a terrible bind that the law exists um, as national law and that we're operating, I mean, I was trying to um, get at this in my discussion that we're operating within these um, nation state notions of law and sovereignty. Um, and um, those of us who are privileged within those systems um, find it very hard not to reiterate them and because the very fact of our ability to to work on these issues has to do with our being, um, you know, rights, sub rights given subjects in these regimes. So I think it, there's a lot of attention uh, inherent in the work, and it's very important to collaborate and not to be, um, you know, to give up privilege and to to be in true dialogue with with people who are um, struggling and in movement. Um, rather than thinking, and I was trying to imply this in my talk, rather than thinking that inclusion in this system of liberal rights is what's needed or desired. Um, there may be other forms of uh, relief and community and mutual aid that are much more meaningful than subjecting migrant people to uh, liberal rights-based politi politics. Um, well, very sadly, that brings us up to 11.30, um, so we should um, draw it to the close. There were some um, qu more questions that we didn't get to, um, but um, I can assure the questioners that I will pass these on to Lisa so that she, um, so that she has them. Um, yes, I would love to. Thank you, everybody, for the questions, and uh, it was really wonderful. Thank you, everybody. It went so quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a real testament that uh, um, an hour and a half on Zoom can feel like a very long time, but this, this has really gone very quickly. Um, so really just uh, to wrap up, thank you very much to um, the team at the Power Institute um, uh, and the director, Mark, for putting on this series, um, to my co-editors at Discipline, Helen Hughes um, and David Homewood and Rob Milne, our designer. Um, and of course, um, Mara Gonzalez, who's been producing this behind the scenes. Um, and made it all run very smoothly. Um, I have uh, sent you as this lecture is ending a survey, a link to a survey. We would love to hear your feedback on this event um, on um, in terms of content and also the technical aspect of it. Um, so please, um, if you have a couple of minutes, fill that in. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about events that we're doing at Power Institute, um, visit our website. You can sign up for our mailing list um, and we will always receive notifications um, of our events. Um, so with that, thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks to our audience for being here. Um, and uh, we'll see you for another event soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>